Okay, it's not quite amateur radio in World War I. What I'm going to be talking about is uh, radio as it was used in the British Army in the First World War. <clears throat> it would have made a tremendous uh, difference had they used it properly and early, but they did not. And that's what really I'm going to talk about, and it would have made a big difference. What I would like to kind of set the stage with, though, is I have a clip from the movie All Quiet on the Western Front. It's made in 1931, which is fairly close to World War I. And it's a reasonably accurate portrayal of what trench warfare was all about and the dominance of the machine gun on the battlefield. This is a uh, German trench line that developed in a spike helmet, and they're going to be attacked by uh, French troops. Okay, uh, the <clears throat> I show the clip because there's a couple things about World War One that was just horrifying. First of all, the casualties uh, incurred were enormous, uh, and I have some casualty figures to show you. It was a brutal war, and the uh, the other key thing is that the power of defense in World War I was overwhelming. In other words, there were, at least when the war started and well into the war, there's no such thing as a tank. The only way you could take a position was to, to do what, just what those Frenchmen were doing, they, to essentially overwhelm the uh, enemy defenses before the machine guns would cut them down. And it was a very, very difficult thing to do. And this attack, had I shown you, it was successful, but most of them weren't. And what they would do is they'd send the troops in, and then the first wave would be shot down, and the second wave would come in and walk over the bodies of 
the first wave and they in turn would be shot down and went on and on like that. And casualty figures I'll show you was uh, very, uh, it reflects that kind of warfare. Now, <clears throat> my colleague Mike Bullock, who's an Englishman, and I wrote a book called Miss Signals on the Western Front. And uh, the whole point of the book is that wireless could and should have been used earlier to uh, basically cut down the uh, number of casualties uh, during the war, but it would have made a tremendous difference in terms of the flexibility and, and the like of uh, military operations. There's a uh, group of people in Britain and the United States called the Western Front Association. And and our particular interest is World War I. We have meetings all over this country and all over Great Britain. And of course, it's in Great Britain, the, uh, as my English friend knows, is uh, you know, World War I is like the Civil War is here in terms of the amount of interest that, that it still holds for, for people. Because both our country and, and, and Great Britain suffered a tremendous trauma in terms of the number of people who died. One of the problems in World War I was the command and control was it terrible problem, meaning that the generals really couldn't, uh, would lose control of the battle once it opened. They had no way of communicating with the troops. And there were very inadequate communications, and I'll show you some of the ways that they did try to communicate. One thing about it, though, was uh, very puzzling to me as a double E and as a person who has been an amateur radio, is why didn't they use wireless sooner? And, uh, Especially in the 1920s, 1920 was KDKA in Pittsburgh, the first commercial station in the United States. So radio in the United States really took off in 1920. And why wasn't it used in World War One? And in the course of the research, I found that the Royal Flying Corps had, in fact, built a handheld or light enough uh, transmitter, uh, continuous wave transmitter, and it was never used. It was never used on the ground. It wasn't used in the air at all. <coughs> In the process of doing this research, I uh, was able to locate a fellow in England, Mike Pollock, who had come to the same conclusion, but from a different direction. He's an expert on the British Army. So we said to each other about five years ago, it would be a good idea to write a book about this. Well, we did, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. Yeah. One question. Didn't Major Armstrong use radios in the... Uh, didn't Major Armstrong use Five radios or in Armstrong. World War One? Deadly. Yeah, Ed, uh, no, Major Armstrong. Uh, Howard Edward Armstrong was his name. He was the American, yeah. Yeah, he's an American. He patented the regenerative amplifier in 1912 and the oscillator in 1912. Uh, neither of which were used. But he, yes, and he was an American, and he actually served in the in the American Army in the Signal Corps, World War One. Uh, World War One came about for a number of reasons. I won't go into them, but the basic German plan in attacking France was called the Schlieffen Plan, and its goal was to pin the French army against the, the French defenses and the, and the German army was to completely outflank the French army going through Belgium. And they failed to do that. They were hoping to win the war in 40 days, and they did not succeed. The French beat them at the Battle of the Marne. And when they failed, When they failed, they retreated a little bit, French advanced a little bit, and eventually came to stabilize the front, which became the Western Front from 1915 to 1918. And the front lines really didn't change very much for three years, uh, primarily because of what the film showed you, the, the very great difficulty involved in breaking through defenses. Uh, this is about a 400 mile long line of parallel trenches. Both sides had generally three parallel trenches, first, second, third lines of defense, and manned it with a, with a huge number of men, close to three million men on each side. And this was the Western Front. As I say, it remained stable for, for uh, three years, and enormous casualties were, were suffered. <coughs> enormous casualties are shown here. Uh, <coughs> Great Britain lost close to a million men, that's the third row. Russia lost a spectacular number, 1.7 million, and so did the, so did the Germans. Um, that's just the battle deaths. These are wounded and then missing in POWs. 
these were enormous casualties. Uh, to put that in perspective, one out of every two Frenchmen alive between the ages of 20 and 40, uh, one out of every two Frenchmen between the ages of 20 and 40 was either dead or severely wounded in the First World War. And uh, similar, similar figures held for the rest of the world. So the casualties, even though the casualties in the Second World War were far greater than the First War, the casualties in the First World War were all servicemen. There were very, very few civilian casualties. And they're, they're just beyond belief. Uh, the Western Front today has uh, cemeteries that stretch from Belgium to Switzerland. They're enormous cemeteries. The, many of the people who died in the war, their bodies were never found. And uh, so there, even though there are tombstones in these cemeteries, those are only the people who, who, whose bodies were recovered. But many, many more were not. And what they would do is they'd write the names of the people whose bodies they couldn't find on a wall. Like this one. <clears throat> so in the back of that cemetery with the tombstones, here's a wall that shows all of the people whose bodies weren't recovered. And this one is particularly interesting because there's a fellow named John Kipling here, and he was the son of Rudyard Kipling, who was the great chronicler of Victorian England. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> Rudyard Kipling spent uh, a long time trying to find his son's body. He wrote a book about it. And there's been several television and, and, and uh, shows about that called My Boy Jack. It's a terribly tragic thing. And the war affected, in England, the war affected whether you were the son of a duke or a Welsh coal miner. The casualties were, were terrible. And in fact, your chances of surviving was better as a coal miner than as a second lieutenant leading uh, your troops over the trenches. Casualties are enormous. The main reason for this was poor communication. Once a battle started, <clears throat> there was no way of determining how well it was going and report back to the general and say it's going particularly poorly and we have a problem here. We need to call in some artillery to take out this particular machine gun nest. Uh, there's no way to do it. But even worse, <clears throat> when a wave of troops, like I showed in the, on the film, when the wave of troops would go forward, and, and the defenses were too hard to crack, uh, they kept sending troops forward, even, even though the first wave had been shot down, the second wave had been shot down, the third wave had been shot, because there was no way to call them back. It was all programmed to take place. The artillery support was there, but it was usually in the form of what they call a curtain barrage, which is a, a curtain of exploding shells that were supposed to move in front of the infantry as they advanced. Uh, but if the infantry were held up, that curtain of shells kept moving without any way calling back saying, well, we better bring it back because the infantry hasn't, hasn't got, got there yet. <clears throat> so communications were, and the lack of it, were a crucial factor. What kind of communications did they have? They had dispatch riders, guys on motorcycles, and uh, <clears throat> It was an issue with that. Of course, the terrain had to be good enough to be able to move on it. And uh, there were no particularly good roads close to the, the front lines and the trenches. And not only that, when, uh, when it was snowing uh, or there were other severe weather conditions, you couldn't get through. So that's not a really particularly good way of doing it. It was also extremely risky. Something like one out of every two of these guys were killed during the war. Another, another method they used was called a heliograph. 